the local campaign. I'm your host, Andy Streisfeld, and tonight we have the debate for the Kitchener Centre Provincial by-election. There are four candidates in the race, and they are for the Ontario NDP, Debbie Chapman, for the Green Party of Ontario, Ashlyn Clancy, and for the Liberal Ontario Liberal Party, Kelly Stice. Rob Elliott is also running um, on behalf of the PC Party of Ontario, but was unable to attend tonight's debate. He and his team extend their best wishes to his fellow candidates. Uh, to begin tonight's events, we'll have a round of opening remarks from each of the candidates. And up first is Debbie Chapman. There's two minutes. Please continue. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Debbie Chapman. Many of you already know me. I've been a Ward 9 City Councillor for five years. That's five years of proven leadership in government. I also teach political science courses at Wilfrid Laurier University. The reason I decided to, re to run to, beco to become Kitchener Centre's next MPP is because I was feeling increasingly frustrated by the way Doug Ford and the Conservatives have slowly taken municipal, po municipal powers away from us, overriding democracy and standing in the way of councillors doing our job. I've been a Kitchener resident for nearly 50 years and it's been hard to see homelessness rise, students lining up at food banks. Just this week we learned food bank use among students has shot up by 220 percent in just one year and at nearly two thousand dollars for a one-bedroom apartment rents have become absolutely untenable. So yes, seniors, students, single parents, young people are really struggling with the high cost of living right now. That's why I'm running as the NDP candidate to fight for a better, easier and affordable life in Kitchener Centre. Electing an MPP to the official opposition means more opportunities to speak up and bring community concerns to the legislature and send a message to the Conservatives. Everyone in Kitchener deserves a strong government that will fight for them and secure victories that make, the easy, that make life easier and stress-free. Stress so here's what I'm fighting for. To bring back rent controls to stop the housing affordability crisis from getting worse, get governments back in the business of building affordable homes and stopping Doug Ford's creeping privatization of our public health care system in its tracks. This by-election is a chance to send Doug Ford and the Conservatives a strong message. As the official opposition, the NDP have the power and resources to hold the Conservatives, of, uh, to hold the Conservatives accountable. Thank you. Up next, Ashley Clancy. Thank you. My name is Ashley Clancy and I'm running to be your next member of Provincial Parliament for Kitchener Centre. In 2021, we learned what it meant to elect a Green. You get someone who cares deeply about the issues of our community, who works hard for you, and who can be an independent voice for the people of our city. We have had an overwhelming response. We put up over 2,000 signs, we have more than 400 people part of our campaign, and have knocked on 65,000 doors. This means we want to listen. We show up, we make eye contact, and we hear what matters to you. I have connected with people as a mother, uh, people who are looking for childcare spaces. They tell me what that means to them. As a school social worker, I see that our health care needs to include mental health care, and we need to work away from crowded classrooms. People feel the stress of crowded classrooms. And as a city councillor and environmentalist, I've seen that we need to build more homes close to the places where we work and play, and we need to get there in a comfortable and affordable way by investing in transit. I want everybody to have a roof and food, and it's only gotten worse over the past five years with Doug Ford. In 2018, when he was elected with a majority, he attacked the things that Kitchener Centre and I care about. He ripped up $500 million of green energy contracts, he cut funding to not-for-profits that are the glue that keeps our society going, and he eroded accountability by firing the envir environmental ombudsman and the child and youth advocate. And when I was elected as a city councillor, he robbed my toolbox. The day after announcing Bill 23, cutting up the green belt and undermining local decision making. People need answers to the affordability crisis, and they need a voice that doesn't put wealthy friends or party line ahead of the people of Kitchener Centre. So on November 30th, vote for a new way of doing politics and vote Clancy. And finally, with our opening remarks, Kelly Stice. Thank you. 
Doug Ford is trying to tell us that we won't need our credit card to access our health care system, yet 2.2 million people in Ontario don't have access to primary health care. A properly funded health care system needs to be a priority. The Ontario Liberal Party proudly stands behind patients, not profits. This means that when Doug Ford and his Conservatives are spending their time working to imp implement private clinics and for-profit health facilities, the Ontario Liberals are saying that our health care is not for sale. Doug Ford and his team support a system where overcrowded classrooms and reducing supports to our children in the education system is an acceptable approach to educating our children. Properly funded public education needs to be a priority. The Liberals implemented policies aimed at reducing class sizes, getting to an average class size of 22 students, yet the Ford government raised that to 28 in 2019. This means that when Doug Ford and his Conservatives are spending their time implementing approaches to education that further disadvantage teachers and impact their learning environments for students, the Ontario Liberals are saying that we need to invest in the education of our children and youth. This is not the Ontario that I want for my family and it is not what I want for Kitchener Centre. We need someone who cares about you and me. I am prepared to fight for an Ontario that is livable, cares about each other, and looks to the future health and prosperity of our province. Elect me as your next MPP to continue to do the work that matters. When it comes to serving the community, my track re record is clear. I look forward to chatting further throughout this debate, and I thank you for this opportunity. We now begin the question and answer portion of our debate. For the first question, we're joined in studio uh, by the Director of News and Programming at City News 570, James Sebastian Scott. Welcome, James. Thank you. My first question uh, is, uh, the PC government is backtracking its decision to open up land to the Greenbelt for more housing development. That decision understandably came with much pushback from the public and is currently under investigation from the RCMP. If the Greenbelt isn't suitable to build on, then where do we build more housing for people who need it most? Thank you, James. So candidates now will have up to two minutes to respond. And it's uh, up first is Ashlyn Clancy. Thank you. Every day when I knock on doors, I hear from more and more young people that have almost given up hope that they'll ever own a home. Uh, now it takes 20 years for a young person to save up 20% for a down payment. That's a generation of of uh, people left behind. Doug Ford's agenda of sprawl is, will only bring expensive types of homes that only benefit developers and jeopardizes our farming economy and the safety of our water. Greens believe that we have the land we need to build affordable homes in the communities where we work and play. As a city councillor, I have voted yes to housing. I know that voting no only makes the housing crisis worse. We need to build starter homes. We can add fourplexes across the province to build gentle density and reduce red tape to make more missing middle homes possible. As a social worker, there's been nothing worse than hearing a family or a caregiver say that they're putting their life on hold while they wait for housing. Our housing list is at about 8,000 people waiting for affordable housing. And we know that the government needs to fund deeply affordable housing by funding co-ops, not-for-profit homes, and supportive housing. This is what makes Greens the answer. We have the solutions not only to add to the supply and the density that we need to stop the sprawl and have sustainable cities, but we also know that the government needs to get back into the, into the <laughs> industry of funding housing. We do both. We want to make sure that everybody has a roof and food because I know that when people have a roof and food, they can thrive and they can reach their potential. Thank you very much. Ms. Stice, you're up next. Thank you. So when we talk about housing, I, I hear that at the doors. That is probably the number one issue. And I want to share a bit of a story. When I was at one house, um, and this mom, she shared with us that she works at Toyota. And she works full time. Her one child attends college. Her other child is high school. And her youngest child is in, in uh, elementary school. And, and before the writ was dropped, I said, don't worry, I will be back once the writ's dropped to let you know when to vote uh, and where to vote. And she said, Kelly, I don't know if I can be here because I don't know that I can afford my house any longer. 
And I said, that's not acceptable. And, I, and it just, it, it, uh, it, it struck me in my heart that this is the Kitchener, this is the Ontario that, the, that our, our community is seeing, and that is not acceptable. And there are many spaces and places to build on without affecting the green belt or affecting our countryside line, which we know is something that is so important to the people of Kitchener Centre and Waterloo Region. And we need to find those spaces and places uh, that already exist. Um, we need to be looking at incre increasing density along our uh, transportation corridors and um, my campaign office uh, is right alongside the GO train. So I see those trains coming in and out and I, and I look up and down the rail and I think, my goodness, um, there are lots of opportunities here. We also need to press ourselves to be more creative. Um, are there opportunities to look at office buildings or strip malls that are being vacated because um, post-pandemic our patterns of work and our patterns of shopping have changed. And I think that those opportunities, um, working along our municipal councillors and our municipal government to say, how can we be partners in this? How can we be partners moving forward um, and also including our federal government to make sure that housing is more affordable? Because we want people like that mom working at Toyota to be able to live in a city, in a region where her kids can walk to school, where they have access to transportation so that they can get to their jobs, so that they can um, go to the grocery store, that they can find the, the things that they need to be able to live and thrive in Kitchener. Thank you very much. We're back to you, James. Oh. Oh. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, Ms. Chavin, your response. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. First, I'd just like to say and mention the fact that um, it was thanks to Mart Stiles and all her amazing hard work um, that got the, um, the forced the Conservative government to reverse their decision on the Greenbelt. And yes, housing is a human right. Every level of government has an obligation to ensure that every person in this province has a place to call home. But unfortunately, in the region alone, we have over 8,000 households that are on the affordable housing waiting list. A list that can take seven to eight years for people to, to get off and, and to actually be housed. We have 1,200 chronically homeless people in this region. And I'm not talking about the, across the province, this is just here locally. So we have a crisis. And the NDP has plans to um, bring back rent control. Doug Ford took away rent control and this has created a horrible situation for many people where their rents can be doubled from one month to the, uh, to the next. Rent control needs to be brought back in. There's plenty of land to build new housing, and this was demonstrated very clearly at, with the regional official plan um, process, where there was plenty of land to build the housing that's needed in this region and to meet the needs of every person um, in, this, in, this, in this region. I assume across the province, within urban boundaries, the, the situation is the same. Um, the governments need to get back into the business of building affordable um, non-market housing. This is not new, it's happening in Toronto already, Nova Scotia is doing the same, and this was done prior to 1990. Um, governments were in that business and that has um, been eliminated. It needs to be brought back so that we can, uh, we can assure that housing as a human right is, is respected and that everybody has a place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Uh, now, James. Thank you, Andy. <coughs> we have seen the current government <coughs> utilize MZOs or Ministry Zoning Orders at a exponential rate uh, over the course of this uh, government's time in power uh, to expedite development on specific parcels, parcels of land. Why are these MZOs problematic and what is party's, your party's stance on using them? And is there a need to keep using them? All right, and we'll start with you, Kelly. So I think we're, we're starting to uncover um, the depth of um, frustration that uh, people across Kitchener Centre are feeling, and quite frankly, across the province. I don't think that any of this frustration is, is really unique to Kitchener Centre. And we're seeing the um, huge number of MZ, MZO uh, approvals that were uh, um, ap approved by the, the uh, provincial government, um, the conservative government, 
in much larger numbers than we've ever seen um, prior to this government taking, taking, uh, in, taking government. And I think the challenge for us is that it speaks to the process that Doug Ford takes um, when in, in his government. And that is one of uh, suspicion, one that lacks transparency and lacks integrity. And if it did ha it have uh, all of those things, then we, he wouldn't be under investigation at this point in time. And the province of Ontario, we as voters deserve a government that um, offers integrity, that offers honesty and transparency. And um, there may be a place for MZOs, um, but they are only to be used in extreme circumstances, not as everyday occurrences, uh, so that you can push uh, forward your agenda, so you, you can push forward um, benefiting your friends, because that is the only outcome that we've seen of this uh, accelerated uh, approvals of, the, of, of MZOs. Thank you. Ms. Chapman. Yeah, thank you. Um, MZ, MZOs undermine the democratic process. When we look at development and look at land use, it's always done with public consultation, with um, documents that have been prepared by our local staff people, um, by the provinces under the um, Planning Act. So there's a whole process behind what's done when we determine how we're gonna use land. I would say no, MZO should not be available to Doug Ford at all because it's an abuse of power and it's merely ser serving his interests and the interests of his um, supporters, but they're not serving the interests of the community or the people in this province. It's profit driven um, and this is not the way to do politics. So no, I do not support the use of MZOs under this current government. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Clancy. I think uh, we've seen over the past five years that pro uh, process is lacking. Uh, I find as a city councillor on a regular basis we get new legislation that impacts how we operate and it's a by the way approach. Uh, uh, the way that we work at the City of Kitchener is that we rely on our experts, our staff, we, we talk to the community and we make decisions together and then we vote as a council, as elected officials. Um, I don't trust the way that this government has moved forward. We need to get speculators out of the way we use our land, out of the way, out of our housing market. Speculation has only driven up the price of farmland, making it impossible for young people to get into farming. A friend of mine inherited half a farm and almost couldn't continue farming because they couldn't afford half of the farm and whilst they inherited some and we hear of farmers moving to PEI on a regular basis because they can't afford to live here, they can't afford to farm here. That's jeopardizing our food security, the food security for my children, our children, uh, and we can't eat money, last time I checked. So I think what, as so long as uh, we have this government in charge, we have to challenge them to have a better process because otherwise we continue to spend oodles of money challenging them, uh, going through court system, spending staff time, trying to adjust to all of these changes. It's expensive, it's not good for anybody, and it jeopardizes our farming community and the places we love, like our wetlands and our, our climate future. So uh, as long as this government is doing it the way that it's being done, it's not appropriate. Any decision that we make for Ontario has to be thoughtful, it has to be data-driven, it has to be consultative, and it has to be formed in democracy. Thank you very much. James? During our first question about the Green Belt, we alluded to the housing affordability crisis, but uh, we haven't touched yet on uh, your plans for how to address homelessness in Kitchener Centre. Uh, I don't think it's a secret that if you drive past Victoria and Weber right now, there is an, uh, a homelessness issue in, uh, in that riding and in our community. Uh, so what is the plan for each of the parties to address that issue in our community? Ms. Chap, go first. Yes, thank you. I mean, this is, a, this is a really big problem. As I said earlier, housing is a, a human right and everybody deserves to have a house and a home, a place to call home. There are, as I said earlier, also uh, the 1,200 chronically homeless people in this, in this region. And that's unacceptable. For somebody who grew up here to think that this is the state of our city right now, it's actually quite embarrassing to, to acknowledge. There are different things that can be done. Rent control has to be brought in, but of course we first of all have to have the physical structures for people to live in. Um, 
the government needs to get back into the business of building affordable um, non-market housing. It's not good enough to build high-rise, expensive, tiny condos that nobody can afford, or people, certainly people that are homeless cannot afford and will never be able to afford, and to consider that, that adequate housing stock. We need to do purpose-built, affordable housing. And the only way to do that is to either build it ourselves as, as governments, get back into that business, or ensure that in every new building, every new residential building, a certain percentage of those units are affordable. And there are ways to do that. In Denmark, they have this 40-40-20, so the luxury um, units subsidize the, the affordable units. It's be creative, right? Let's bring in inclusionary zoning, which will allow us to do that. And talk about deeply affordable, not 80% of market value, which is what the C CMHC considers affordable, but look at 30% of a full-time minimum wage. And as a member of the, Ontario, or the Kitchener Housing Strategy for All Subcommittee of Affordability, that was what we came up with as a workable, affordable price. 30% of a full-time minimum wage, which is $860 rent a month for a one-bedroom apartment. That is very difficult to find in this region right now, but that's what we should be striving for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clancy. Thank you. Um, at this moment in time, 200 people are facing this winter unsheltered in Kitchener-Waterloo, 280 in the region. And this is after we've doubled shelter spaces. We've added 300 new shelter spaces since the beginning of 2020. Uh, like Debbie said, we've had a tripling of homelessness. This is not normal. This is not normal times. Just the other day, I was at the YWCA thrift store, and they shared a story that a young lady came into their shop and said she didn't know how to live outside this winter, um, and she was asking for help. She was bewildered. Um, in my uh, relationship with the Better Tent City, uh, they say eviction prevention is addiction prevention. So that's the approach I've taken in my role as city councillor. When a uh, townhome complex at Blucher uh, Street was facing rent eviction, we banded together with local stakeholders, the Social Development Centre and the Waterloo Region Community Legal Services to make sure that nobody was left behind. We have to uh, tackle this issue of rent eviction. People are dis being displaced at an alarming rate. In Toronto, the rate uh, it, for every unit we build of affordable housing, we lose 15 in the private market. And in Hamilton, for every unit we build of affordable housing, we lose 29 in the private sector. Kitchener, we're on our way, thanks to work I've done on City Council, to build the data we need to understand the issue and work on the tools. I thank our staff as we work towards finding a way to prevent anybody else from losing their shelter. We need to take action, we need to stop rent evictions, and we need to increase supply of affordable, attainable, and deeply affordable housing in Kitchener Centre because we can't let anybody else face this winter outside. Thank you. Ms. Thijs. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about who is homeless. Um, we talk a lot and we know that there are people out there who are homeless who are, are dealing with mental health issues, who are dealing with drug addi addiction issues. But homelessness is starting to hit a number of other people. I have chatted with students who are coming into our region to attend college and university who are living in tents. I know that there are families who are working uh, full-time jobs, yet can only afford to live in a tent. And so homelessness is affecting all kinds of people. And so our solutions need to be very um, complex as well, because there are a, a number of different things that we need to do to be able to support those who are homeless. We have a number of great organizations uh, in our region who offer support such as shelter care. So more than just putting a ho house or a, a, a roof over their heads, they're bringing in uh, the, the right services and the right supports. We see that through the working center. We see that through House of Friendship, where they co-locate services and supports to um, enhance the lives of people so that they can continue to grow and develop and move on and be able to get into rental housing. We also need to look at social housing, uh, opportunities for projects. 
And the Liberals made substantial investments in social housing projects aimed to provide safe and affordable living spaces for vulnerable po populations. We need to continue to do that. And we also need to continue to provide first-time home, home buyer support um, so that we can get people into homes and out of tents. Um, we need to make sure that people who can work full-time, that we can get them into the housing that they would like to see. James? One other thing that we're facing in this community is not just the, the issues of housing affordability, homelessness, uh, and things like that, but also a doctor shortage. Uh, when it comes to approaching recruiting more doctors to our area so everyone can have a family doctor, what is your party's plan to look at that issue and ensure that we can have more family doctors for folks who need it? Ms. Clancy. This government has undermined our public health care system by spending our tax dollars taking nurses to court to fight over unreasonably low wages. Doctors also need to be recognized and given the right to earn a, a wage that is commensurate with what they need. Uh, we spent so many tax dollars privatizing health care, moving people out of our public system into private health care. We just heard the other day on the news that for surgeries done in for-profit clinics, uh, taxpayers are spending twice as much. We are undermining this public, uh, this public health care system that we know and love. And where is it landing? On emergency rooms. The Doug Ford government has downloaded health care, mental health care, addictions, housing, housing solutions. And so people end up overwhelming our emergency rooms and making staff burn out. I think uh, Jim Erb said the other day that we are spending over $150 million more in our regional budget trying to make up the gaps for the health care cuts and, uh, and downloading that's happening because of the province. So we need to address this doctor shortage. That's also what's landing on emergency rooms. We're short beds, we're short doctors. There's so much we can do. We have so many newcomers in our community that need these bridging programs to help them with their qualifications. We can create a state-of-the-art uh, doctor recruitment program where we can uh, invite people to come and see our beautiful city and make sure that they know how good of a place it is to live and we also need to support family doctors by creating health teams. I think when GPs are uh, spending money on offices and uh, extra workers and there's such a shortage they're overwhelmed. We need to recognize this, we need to build around that and support them. Thank you. Ms. Thanks. Thank you. So we, we are seeing um, a, a shortage and it is impacting our ability to <coughs> access family health care. Uh, 2.2 million Ontarians are without a family health care provider and that it will only continue to grow if we continue to allow this current government to prioritize profits over people. And that's why I'm so proud of the Ontario Liberal government and Dr. Adil Shamji, who has brought in patients, not profits, that a privatized system is not a system that we want to welcome in, that we need to have public health care. And by doing so, we also will provide an opportunity to make sure that we are addressing the administrative burdens that family health care providers have said loud and clear uh, is a problem for them in their practice. That we need to, uh, to remove some of those barriers that uh, make it difficult for family physicians to want to get in to this practice. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the family health teams because the Liberals placed an emphasis on providing primary health care and we're looking at those primary health teams because we need to make sure that everyone has access to a family physician within a radius, that the family physician and access to that primary care can be nimble, can be supportive, can help people get through um, kind of the initial stages of, of their health care needs, um, including mental health. Um, in, including access to, um, to, to drugs and then keeping them out of the emergency system because it is a domino effect then when, that when people can't access a primary health care physician, they are accessing our emergency rooms and then we are seeing longer waits and um, longer times and then we see the backup 
of our paramedics not being able to offload their patients. It's a domino effect that we can't wait any longer to address. Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Yeah, thank you. So healthcare is near and dear to the NDP. I mean, we can think back to Tommy Douglas and the, the introduction of universal um, health care. So we continue to see this as one of the um, cornerstones of, of what we do in the, in the province of Ontario. Wait times. I've, I've spoken to um, residents at Doors and they've, to they've talked to me about how they've had to wait in a hospital for tw 12 hours to, just to see a doctor. Referrals to specialists can take months. What used to take one or two months is, is now up to 16 to 18 months. Um, and as has been mentioned, that we have a, a family doctor shortage, um, which is un unacceptable. We need to find ways to not just train, but re retain and recruit new doctors to the province of Ontario to, to uh, meet the needs of, this, of the people in this province. But the Ford government has done anything but to solve the pro or address the needs of health care and instead star starve the health care system for the past five years. And this, by doing this, he's been privatizing different aspects of the health care system, bringing in um, health care ca providers um, out that co are coming in from outside of the pu public sector. They're being paid by the public sector to service the, to benefit the private sector. And it's creating um, a very expensive health care system here in Ontario. Once things start being privatized and we create this two-tier system, which we're well on our way to uh, of doing, it's a slippery slope and there's no way of coming back out. I spoke to somebody the other day that told me they had to pay $75 out of pocket to see a medical doctor, a family doctor. Um, so already these things are happening and the Ontario, people in Ontario expect public health care. We deserve public health care and the NDP will continu continue to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. So now we're going to go, we're going to mix things up. We're going to go now candidate to candidate. So we're going to start with you, Ms. Stice. Go ahead, pick. Oh, my question. Okay. So my question is, what policy do you disagree with within your own party? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so what policy do you disagree with within your own party? So okay, so this I guess we'll start with um, let's let's kick it to you, and then we'll and then we'll kick it to Miss Chapman afterwards. So Miss Clancy, you can answer it first, and then and Miss Chapman afterwards. I think uh, to be honest, I would adjust the inclusionary zoning metrics. Uh, we have a pretty high standard, and I've seen. Uh, that in Quebec that stalled development. I think we're at a very different economic period than we, when we were when we developed that, pro, that parameter. I do believe in inclusionary zoning and I've pushed as a city councillor to improve what we're doing locally. Uh, so I think we always have to make sure that we're pushing for as many affordable units as we can from the private sector. We can't rely on the private sector to solve all the problems, but we also don't want to stifle development. So we have to find that sweet spot between the amount of units that we are demanding from the private sector without that impeding the amount of <coughs> supply, because we need <coughs> supply, we need uh, units to be brought online round, right now. Yeah, thank you, interesting question. Um, actually, prior to running for this um, seat, I did a lot of research on all the parties. Um, in fact, I was invited to, to run by one of the other parties, and I, I chose the NDP because I really don't have any, there are no policies sure. that I actually feel are questionable okay. for me at this time. So um, that's why I'm here, and I will continue to um, work with the NDP team, which is the official opposition. And in fact, the only party um, here at the table that um, has official party status. So, thank you. Thanks for the question. <laughs> thank you. And, and Kelly, it is such a good question. We'll ask you, what do you disagree with your party? <laughs> you, you know what? It, well, and I was wondering if these would come <laughs> back, right? So, and I appreciate this format. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, so, what do I disagree with? So, you know what? I'll, I'll jump off of what you said. Absolutely. The city, uh, sorry, um, the, the Ontario Liberal Party does not have uh, official party status at this point in time. We have nine MPPs. And, uh, but I think it's no coincidence that our election is being called two days before we announce our leader. I think that the announcement of our leader makes this government nervous. 
and uh, I, am, I am proud to stand as an as Ontario Liberal um, and uh, look forward to forming government in 2026. And, and having said that though, um, we don't have a fully formed platform because we don't have a leader. And I think that that makes it uh, uh, a challenge for us. And uh, not to have all of the answers to all of the questions, to have all of the so solutions to all of the problems. But what I'm really looking forward to is when our new leader is selected on December 2nd, that I'm going to be at that table helping inform policy uh, for our government moving forward, for our party moving into the 2026 election. Um, I'm proud to, to see what we will move forward. Um, and there's a lot at stake. There's, you know, we, we've just talked about it. We've talked about our health care. We've talked about housing. We've not yet talked about education. I assume at some point we will. Um, a lot is at stake. And if we don't have a government in place that is prepared to work for the people, that is not is prepared to work uh, not for profits uh, and not being profit driven, then our province will be able to move ahead. Um, we need a government that is going to be able to invest in the economic viability um, of our future as well because we can't continue to pull taxpayer dollars from, uh, from, from people in Ontario because we're one taxpayer um, with finite resources. So, Ms. Chavez, we're going to give it to you. Okay. Yeah, the hits just keep on coming. So now, <laughs> when you when you name, name the one that you want to ask first, so the other person doesn't feel awkward. So, can we respond? Uh, is there a, 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 a thirty-second rebuttal, or is that sure? Uh, there's a thirty-second rebuttal. Would you like to? Respond? I would like to mention something. Okay, please. The beauty of the Green Party is that our our vote is not whipped. So I can disagree with people within my party, and that means that I can speak up for Kitchener Centre. I'm not handed a script and told what to say. I'm not told how to vote, and I can put the people before the party. So one thing that I appreciate that I think your question raises is that I can debate within my party, and we can have a disagreement, but we can move forward and put our community first. So before I ask, is there anybody who would like to jump on that rebuttal before we, we allow, if Ms. Dice, if there's anything you want to respond to that, or are you okay with that? But we'll go with Ms. Chapman first. Yeah, um, I guess I, I would just add to, um, to my response is that teamwork is, for me, key. I, I'm a city councillor, and we pretty well are islands in our own right. And to the end, what the t NDP brings to me is teamwork and difficult discussions and um, work that um, can bring to some amazing outcomes. So um, it's, that team is, is very important at the, political, at the provincial level. Are we good? Would you like to, or are sure? We well, I, I just um, I appreciate you know Ashlyn's uh, point that the Greens are not whipped, um, and I think that that is an interesting uh, approach that a lot of people might think. Okay, what does it mean to to not be whipped? Um, but when you're part of a party, um, you work together as a party in the best interest of uh, the people that you were that elected you to to be in that position. Uh, but being part of a party that has a strong base and strong connection means that you can move legislation through, that you can actually form government. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to. All right. So, Debbie, we're going to you. Same thing. Name, you, <laughs> name yeah. the person and then the other person will respond. Okay. So, um, the NDP is the official opposition and has effectively exposed Doug Ford's corruption. Meanwhile, the Greens and the Liberals, uh, we can start with the Greens don't even have party status provincially at this point. Practically, that means very few opportunities over the next three years for them to speak up at Queen's Park on local issues or to challenge the government on how their agenda is impacting people in Kitchener. Do you think it's realistic to promise the people of Kitchener that a Liberal, Green, Liberal or Green MPP would be able to hold Doug Ford to account? Okay. Thank you. Can I go ahead? Yep. Well, one thing that I appreciate about the Greens and I appreciate about Mike Schreiner is actually people call him the unofficial opposition. If you asked MPPs in Queen's Park uh, who they collaborate with, they will say Mike Schreiner. We play, we collaborate with each other. It's something that I appreciate in City Council is building relationships across party lines. That helps us put the people first. Instead of voting no against something just because it's somebody else's idea, frustrates the heck out of people. They want their needs met and they want action to be taken. I asked Mike Schreiner, you know, 
If I'm going to run for this, I want to know that I'm making a difference. He assured me that we move the needle. He gave an example about how Greens came out first with uh, doubling ODSP and OW. NDPs followed suit. Liberals uh, it came up with their solution and, and the, the PCs ended up uh, tacking on ODSP to inflation. We tend to go first with party policy. We move the needle by coming forward with the best policy and the best ideas. And that's what I think matters. And I think if you want to know if Greens can make a dis difference, you don't have to look any further than Mike Morris. He speaks more at the House of Commons than I would say most other MPs. Why? Because he gets people to sign his petitions. He gets people to come together on ideas. He works collaboratively so that we could get the uh, candidate disability support benefit uh, further along. We are known as collaborators. We're known who, as those who work together. It's okay to have the party opposition, but if you don't work with others, you're still not getting ideas further ahead. So I think we move the needle. We've shown this area, what it means to elect a Green, how often we get to speak, how much we do to serve our community, and we move the needle by coming forward with policies that people adopt, other parties adopt, and, and uh, move forward with us. So can we hold Doug Ford to account? I think all of us in our own right can speak and uh, lobby and challenge him. But at the end of the day, we have Doug Ford who is not prepared to move for anything or anyone except his rich friends. And it doesn't matter how strong or compelling the argument is, he just doesn't care. Um, and we see that time and time and time again. Um, through and you know we can name all of the examples. Let you know continue to go through uh, the green belt and healthcare and all of those areas where he ties us from making any positive change outside of his party. It does take collaboration. It's going to have to take collaboration for us to move forward. As I mentioned, uh, you know it's it's no coincidence that our election is November thirtieth. And we will, the Ontario Liberals will declare their leader on December 2nd. And I think we make him nervous. But I'm glad because I want to make sure that the Ontario Liberal Party is elected in 2026 so that we can bring people and ideas together for the betterment of Ontario. And I look forward to being a strong voice. We have been without a strong voice at Queen's Park for quite some time now. And I, I think for us, that has been a disservice to all of us in Kitchener Centre. And so for me, it takes someone who's going to show up, who's going to be present, who knows how to speak up, who has proven leadership, and who has proven community connections to be able to make a difference. All right, that doesn't get you to answer your own question. What was my question? <laughs> well, we are the official opposition, and a good example of the the um, effectiveness of, of the um, the NDP has, is the Green Belt, the most recent victory that I would say that <clears throat> the NDP has um, that we can share with the rest of Ontarians. Um, it, it, we have the resources, we have the the people, um, and the power to to be that official opposition, and. Um, the other parties, yes, they play an important role, that's for sure. I mean, everybody, every politician has a role to play. But um, we will continue to, to hold Doug Ford to account. The RCMP investigation is still underway. There are other um, things that the, the party is digging deep to, to expose. And um, yeah, uh, there, there is a, a definitely an advantage to, to being that official opposition at this time. So thank you. All right. <coughs> so, Ashlyn, last but not least, you get to ask a question, but again, name the person so that at least we know who goes first to answer and second afterwards, okay? Thank you. I'll invite Debbie to respond first. Um, Ms. Chapman, uh, in the last few months, you voted against affordable housing. These are amendments that would save people $500 a month in rent for 20 years. I, approximately 60 <laughs> families would benefit from saving $500 a month in their rent. You voted against that, and yet you say that you're an advocate for affordable housing. This is one of the few tools that we have as city councillors to use to increase density uh, um, and make our buildings more affordable and more sustainable. I ask why you can, what would you say to those families who can appreciate $500 a month in savings 
Why would you, how can you defend that to those families? And I'll ask Kelly, would you, would you make that decision? Would you increase density in our, in our city in, in, in return for having more affordable units and sustainable buildings? All right, so you addressed it to Kelly first. Oh, sorry, sorry Debbie, first, Debbie yeah. first, okay. Yeah, great question. Um, I have approved more units, more <coughs> housing units in this region, in this city, I guess not region, but in this city, than any other um, person standing at this table. Um, I have been a, cal a city councillor for five years, and believe me, many, 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 many developments have come over my, across my table that I have approved. There are some uh, um, developments that I do not approve, just as um, Ms. Clancy, you didn't approve the one at Lancaster Road, Lancaster Street. There are reasons why certain applications we will reject based on different, different reasons. I've got a, a development before me right now in my ward that's on Benton Street, which will mean the displacement of 30 household, 30, 30 people, I think about 25 households. I can't support that. It means getting rid of affordable housing stock, and it means pu pushing people out into the street. There are different reasons why, why one might disapprove of affordable, of, and, and they're not affordable, first of all. These are not affordable housing units. Um, if 80% of market value, which works out to about fifteen to $18,000 to $17,000 a month, for the peop most of the people that, that are looking for housing, that is not an affordable rent. Affordable, as I said earlier, would be 30% of a full-time minimum wage. And in my time in, in office for the past five years, there's not one affor deep affordable housing unit that would uh, accommodate that, that type of income. We have, we have rent geared to income, we've got supportive housing, and then we've got a divide line, and that's the full-time minimum wage earner who no longer qualifies for that subsidized housing or that affordable housing. We can't talk about affordable housing as 80% of market value when we have people that are making full-time minimum wages that cannot afford to find a place to rent. So I don't think there's not one development that I'm aware of where there was affordable housing at that threshold where, that I have, I have voted against. I am a big advocate for affordable housing. Oh, I'm going to move this over. That's it. All right, Kelly. So Ashlyn, thank you for the question. And I think your question was, would I vote to, uh, in favor of increasing de density for more affordable units? And my answer clearly is yes. And I'm, I, because I don't have anything more to add. I think it's, it's, uh, it's so important that we make sure that we are doing the right thing, which means increasing density and building affordable units. All right, and Ashlyn, just back to you. Yes, I think every uh, development and every housing proposal that we put forth in the city has to be thoughtful. I'm glad that we have a displacement bylaw where we will reinstate units that will be lost uh, in development, and I think this should be province-wide. I would vote, I did vote to have affordable units added to buildings because I, if people can have $1,500 to $1,700 in rent, they would prefer that to $2,200. And so I always try to think, what is the housing that we need and how do I ensure that I have the voice of those prospective residents of that building in my mind when I'm making that vote? Nothing's perfect, but just like housing situation we're in is death by a thousand cuts, we need to look at creative solutions all across the board. I love looking at the for-profit union co-op where people make a five to seven percent buy and protect affordable units. They keep that affordable units, uh, that affordable stock in our community, and it's an investment in our community. I will do my best to promote the preservation of, of the units we have. I will vote against displacement. So whenever I'm worried that somebody will be out onto the streets, um, we've done so much in my time in council to move that conversation forward. When I got there in the beginning, uh, people came forward and uh, uh, an individual came forward at a proposal on Ottawa Street and said, I have, I live on ODSP, I have mental health challenges. If I lose this unit in this new development, I'm worried I'll be homeless. I've been pushing since that day with our staff, with our council to do better and moving uh, forward with developers to make sure that they reach out to every tenant and make sure that they are not left behind. And since then we've seen developers come forward 
come to our council chamber and tell us what the plan is, that they've reached out ahead of time to tenants to make sure that they won't be left behind. So I think we need displacement prevention across the province, but we need to make sure that we are not sacrificing affordable units because we, we are in approving density. I noticed that uh, Ms. Chapman has asked for a rebuttal, 30 seconds. Yeah, okay, um, I just wanna say, um, you may recall, um, Ms. Clancy, that um, the Ford government has introduced and an allowed for an inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, and at the Planning and Strate Strategic Initiatives Committee meeting, the region came back to us saying that we would allow 1% of the units be affordable, affordable being 80% of market value, and for 25 years. Ford offered us 5% of the units be affordable at 80% of market value, and you voted against the regions, um, you voted in favor of the region's proposal of 1%. I was the only city councillor who voted against it. And the reason for that, it made a mockery of a tool that the lower tiered municipalities have at our, at our availability to actually get affordable housing in the, in the, in the development projects. So you flip flopped at council a week later, but um, that was, that's, that's the way that whole thing played out. 1% of affordable units in every new development is not gonna cut it. Yes, a 30 second rebuttal, uh, go ahead. So I, I do believe you have your facts somewhat wrong. So this was a preliminary report by the staff of the City of Kitchener. It looked at started gradually increasing the rate of, of affordable units. So I voted in favor of 27 affordable units as opposed to nothing. I think sometimes if you aim for perfection, you end up with nothing. I would like to move forward with good. If you look at the meeting, you'll see that I push staff to be more aggressive and look to more uh, per uh, higher percentages of affordable housing as we increase to five or over a number of years. What they heard from developers was that development would cease. We've already seen, we, how many holes of the ground are there? We've approved so many units over our time and we see them not getting built. There's a whole economic conversation that we miss out on and if we stall development of units if we say no we make the crisis worse so yes I voted to keep the work going I voted to have 27 affordable units provided by developers because I would rather that than nothing and to stop the work in its tracks with zero percent Kelly we're gonna give you 30 seconds if you like for sure I, I mean I think this is a, a, a nice uh, memory lane of, of what's been going on at Kitchener City Council and Regional Council and I'm really looking forward to what is the future of our province, who can help lead Kitchener Center and uh, that's why I have hope and optimism for us moving forward. Okay. All right, so we are now going to move to our closing statements uh, portion of the show and um, to wrap up things we're going to hear closing statements from our candidates and we'll begin with Kelly Stice, you go, you have one minute on the clock. There you go. Wonderful, thank you. So when I started working for the city of Kitchener more than 21 years ago, that's a long time, my job was to make sure that persons with disabilities had access to programs and services. And that meant working collaboratively with other departments within the city and with service providers in the community to ensure an efficient and meaningful use of available resources so that the children with autism could go to summer camp with their friends and to ensure that people with accessibility needs had their voices heard. Together, we were able to implement real and meaningful changes. And today, I get to listen to the voices in Kitchener and respond so that our community centers are vibrant, responsive, and meaningful spaces. And when I'm not working as a civil servant, I'm a dedicated and engaged volunteer. I have contributed my time to various organizations, including sports teams when my children were younger, to organizations ad addressing food insecurity, like the Food Systems Roundtable and the Waterloo Regional Food Bank. I am respected, known, invested, and trusted. Proven leadership, proven service, proven community commitment defines me. Thank you. Ashlyn, one minute, let's go ahead. We can't afford Ford anymore. The agenda of greed and cuts are making people's lives harder and they're making life more expensive. To, for too long, this government has not done its job and yet handed us a big bill. We see it on our property taxes, we see it in our energy bills, we see it at the grocery store, and we see it in the price of housing. People need a break. <laughs> 
they need someone who is honest, someone who's caring and who will work hard for them and be a, be a voice for the people of Kitchener Centre, not for greedy friends and not for towing a party line. I'm an education worker, a school social worker, and for too long I've been supporting folks to put it together with duct tape. That's what made me stop everything, <laughs> take time away from my kids, quit my job as a school social worker so that I could be dedicated to a better future and a more affordable future for the people of Ontario and the people of Kitchener Centre. So let's do a new kind of politics, vote for something new, vote for something fresh, vote for solutions on November 30th, vote Clancy. And finally, we have Debbie Shaw. Yes, thank you. On November 30th, you have a chance to vote for proven leadership that will fight for your priorities. People are struggling with high costs of rent, housing, basic life. You need a government that will put you first and fight back against Doug Ford and the Conservatives' corruption and cronyism. The best way to do that is to make the NDP stronger. Electing an MPP to the official opposition means more opportunities to speak up and bring community concerns to the legislature and send a clear message to the Conservatives. An MPP from another party won't be able to do this. The NDP have defeated the Conservatives here in Kitchener Centre in the past two elections and I am confident the people of this community are determined to send a strong voice to Queen's Park again so we can secure victories that make life more affordable and easier for you. Together, let's build a caring, stronger, and happier Kitchener. November 30th, vote Debbie Chapman. Thank you. All right. We made it to the end, uh, even though I fluffed it a bit. Yeah, that's what it is. I'd like to thank James uh, Sebastian Scott for joining us tonight here. Thanks to our candidates for joining us. And remember to vote on November 30th and tune into Rogers TV at 9 p.m. for the local results. We'll have the up to minute results as they come in. Uh, again, uh, thanks to everyone for running. It's a great service that you do for us, and we, we do thank you for it. I've been your host, Andy Streiswald, and again, thank you for watching tonight.